Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cinematic Excrement. Our quest to review every movie that has ever won the Razzie for Worst Picture continues, and now we find ourselves in 1986. And this is not something I've been looking forward to. I am about to dive into a movie that many consider to be one of the worst ever made. Although it has developed a cult following over the years, but then so has Battlefield Earth. Well, let's take a look at Howard the Duck. Written by husband and wife team Willard Hike and Gloria Katz, who also served as director and producer respectively, and starring an after credits cameo, Howard the Duck was brought to the big screen by none other than George Lucas. There was a time when the words George Lucas Presents would have inspired optimism. This might be the movie that changed that. The movie was loosely based on the comic book series of the same name, created by Steve Gerber for Marvel Comics, giving it the unusual distinction of being the first Marvel movie. Let that sink in for a minute. Howard the Duck was the first feature-length film featuring a character from Marvel Comics. In the beginning, there was... Howard the Duck. I'm sure this film did not help to convince studios, or Marvel for that matter, that Marvel characters could be viable big screen stars as we wouldn't see another Marvel movie in theaters until Blade in 1998, not counting a few obscure international releases. Howard the Duck was a critical and financial failure for Lucasfilm and distributor Universal, bringing in $15 million domestically versus a $37 million budget. When factoring in the worldwide box office, it made about $38 million but when you consider marketing costs, it was still a failure. Talk about a rotten day. So why was this movie such a flop? Well, there were a number of different factors at play here, but I think the biggest factor that led to its demise at the box office is this. It's stupid. I mean, it's really, really stupid. I apologize if you find my admittedly simplistic explanation disappointing, but there's really not much more to it than that, folks. I'd love to give you a detailed analysis involving film theory and cinematic techniques and pop culture and all that, but it really is that simple. It's a stupid movie. How stupid is it? Well, I'll tell you. The movie begins on Howard's home planet, populated entirely by anthropomorphic ducks. And judging by his mail, Howard's name is actually Howard T. Duck. That'd be like if my name was Sean T. Human. And I don't think I have seen more terrible puns in five minutes. Marshington, D.C., May Nest, W.C. Fowls, Breeders of the Lost Stork, that's a double pun, Splash Dance, Play Duck, Birdweiser, we get it. It's a world populated by ducks. You didn't have to spell that out for us by throwing so many puns in our faces. And is it me, or has he decorated his walls with a lot of posters? Who does that? Weirdo. And yes, you did hear me mention Play Duck, because in addition to duck puns, this movie also has duck boobs. Duck. Boobs. Wasn't this billed as a family film? I can only imagine the look of what the fuck that appeared on the audience's collective faces when that shot came up. You thought you were buying a ticket to a fun adventure with an alien from another world. But no, you bought a ticket for duck boobs. Why? In the name of all that is good and green, why? And I'm not even sure if I have to blur those out since, you know, they're not real boobs. But the advertisers have been jumpy lately, so I'm not taking any chances. Anyway, and as yet unexplained phenomenon suddenly yanks Howard through his apartment building and past another set of duck boobs. Why? And he is flung into outer space and asphyxiates and dies. Huh, short movie. Ah, no such luck, as our feathered friend somehow survives being flung across space and time and lands safely in Cleveland, Ohio. But then he immediately gets his ass kicked by half the city. And you know, I typically watch these movies several times in advance to prepare for these reviews, and this is no exception. So I know what's coming later. And with that in mind, watching Howard suffer, even if just for a few minutes, is rather cathartic. After getting his ass kicked, Howard runs into rock band leader Beverly Switzler, played by Leah Thompson, just as she's being assaulted by a couple of thugs. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. Just in case you thought they'd run out of duck puns. Howard then proceeds to help Beverly kick their asses using his quack foo skills, kill me now, and boy this score from John Barry does not fit this scene. Yeah. 
It sounds so majestic and powerful and dignified. Basically, it's everything this movie is not. I think something like this would have been more fitting. Also, how is it that he was easily getting his ass handed to him before, but now he's fucking Bruce Lee? Is a little consistency too much to ask? Now, I suppose I should say a few words about the Howard the Duck costume that was worn by Ed Gale, although his voice was dubbed by Chip Zian. Well, let me tell you exactly what I think about that friggin' costume. It's fine. Really, it's fine. It's not great, but for 1986, that's about as good as it was gonna get. And Gale honestly does a pretty good job with his performance, which is remarkable considering he basically couldn't see while he was in that suit. I assume that's why he almost eats it when trying to walk down these stairs. I'm not sure why they chose to use that take in the movie, unless that was somehow the best take they had, which is a depressing thought. Of course, it would have been better had they not used a costume at all and instead made this an animated movie, which, for the record, is what they originally wanted to do. But because Lucas's contract was specifically for live-action movies, Universal said no. It's too bad, really. This movie could have looked so much better. That wouldn't have fixed the crappy writing, but, you know, at least it would have been good-looking crap. I guess. Well, where were we? Not wanting to leave her rather strange rescuer out in the rain, Beverly takes him back to her place and they have this long and boring conversation about how Beverly's in a band and they're trying to get rid of their sleazy manager, and it turns out Howard's a musician himself and you get no bonus points for figuring out where this is going. Of course he ultimately beats the shit out of their sleazeball manager and gets them out of their contract. Well, I would be happy for them if I cared. Anyway, once Howard falls asleep, I assume out of boredom, Beverly does what any perfectly normal person would do. She goes through his wallet. Remember kids, if you ever invite someone into your home, always rifle through their personal belongings while they're asleep. It's only polite. And of course, more puns. And they ain't getting any better. And... a condom? Ooh, foreshadowing. You think I'm joking. And for the next half hour or so, we basically have a series of shockingly bad attempts at comedy. Howard is introduced to an alleged scientist named Phil, played by Tim Robbins. And Robbins isn't content to merely avoid subtlety. He gives subtlety a savage beating as if it owes him money. It's nothing! <laughs> it's nothing! Never mind! I apologize to any of you who are watching this while wearing headphones. And his reaction to Howard is just... dumb. In the scene where he meets Howard, which only lasts about five minutes but feels like five years, first he starts talking to him using a Donald Duck voice, as if Howard would somehow understand English in a silly voice, but not English spoken normally. And then he insists on testing Howard for superpowers. Why would he think he'd have superpowers? He's a fucking duck! Was Phil supposed to be like a parody of nerdy comic book fans? If he is, it's not a very good parody, and if it's not that I don't know what the hell he's doing, except that it's criminally unfunny. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a duck. A duck is a bird, numbnuts. Robin's performance here is pretty bad, and Thompson isn't much better. She delivers her lines with all of the nuance you would expect from a middle school winter play. That's the way you want it. And so long, ducky. If you look very closely at that, hmm, you can see the exact moment where Leah's dignity spontaneously combusts. And here's the thing. I've seen Thompson in other movies, including movies she made around this time. Back to the Future, for example. So I know she can do better. And though it was very early in his film career, I'm pretty sure Tim Robbins could have done better. So what happened here? Did Willard Hike just really not know what to do with these two? Or perhaps this really was the best he could do with the movie's god-awful dialogue. But then Hike and Katz wrote the screenplay, so they have no one to blame but themselves. I will give Leah this much. She did all of her own singing in the movie, and she doesn't sound half bad. Her performance may have been laughable, but hey, at least you could sing. Too bad I couldn't give half a shit about any of the stuff involving her and her band. You'd think involving an anthropomorphic duck would at least make it mildly interesting. And you'd be wrong. This is beginning to seriously undermine my self-esteem. 
Anyway, Howard and Beverly soon become close friends, maybe a little too close. And this leads to one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. And keep in mind, I've seen all three Fifty Shades movies. Howard suggests he and Beverly could possibly be more than just friends. And Bev is apparently into it. I think I'm gonna barf. I just can't resist your intense animal magnetism. I told you that condom was foreshadowing. You didn't think it would happen, did you? You didn't think you were going to see Howard's feathers <coughs> stand at attention. Well, clearly you have underestimated the depraved minds that worked on this movie. This does not bode well. Fortunately, Phil shows up to put a stop to this nonsense, and he's brought a couple of actual scientists with him. The one in charge, Dr. Walter Jenning, played by Jeffrey Jones, is able to explain how Howard got here. Basically, a science experiment gone wrong brought Howard to our world, and they think they can reverse the experiment to send him home. Simple, right? Well, unfortunately, we're not even an hour into the movie, and nothing has really happened yet, which means they have to make it unnecessarily complicated. The experiment results in a massive explosion, which brings the police, and results in Dr. Jennings somehow getting sent to an alternate universe. And when he returns to Earth, he brings something, or perhaps someone, back with him. And he keeps convulsing and groaning in pain as whatever he brought back slowly takes over his body. So naturally, they have him drive the getaway car, with predictable results. <laughs> Is there some reason why Beverly, the human who is not currently being taken over by an alien host, couldn't have driven the damn car? Or would that have just been too sensible for this movie? After nearly crashing the car, Dr. Jennings' body is finally taken over by someone calling himself the Dark Overlord of the Universe, a demon from another world. So does his driver's license list his name as Overlord O the Universe? And the voice Jones used for the Dark Overlord is... Well, imagine if he had smoked an entire carton of cigarettes and then swallowed a Brillo pad. I'm not jetting anymore. The transformation is complete. This is our villain, folks. It took almost an hour to introduce him, and let me tell you, it was not worth the wait. Am I really supposed to find this scary? Because I just find it annoying. And what really boggles the mind is the way Howard and Beverly react to Jennings' transformation. Somehow, despite all the events leading up to this and the obviously different voice and facial expressions and everything, they don't believe him when he says he's no longer Dr. Jennings. It's not just the movie that's stupid. The characters are stupid too. The laser beam hit the nexus of Sominus. What is that? A suburb of Cleveland? <laughs> it lies beyond the planets. Case in point, you'd have to be stupid to laugh at that joke. And the Dark Overlord's physical transformation isn't much better. His body slowly deforms over time as the Overlord takes over, which in and of itself is a good idea, but it looks pretty hokey, and by the time the transformation is finished, he looks like Albert Einstein fucked a Stegosaurus. Anyway, we get some more terrible comedy, and then the Overlord kidnaps Beverly, because of course he does, and through a wacky turn of events, Phil and Howard end up running from the police in an ultralight, and the the only reason the police are able to give chase at all is they keep the plane just a few feet above ground and follow the road the entire time. There is absolutely no logical reason for them to do so, but they do it anyway because otherwise we would have no chase sequence with which to pad the running time. Long story short, they manage to stop the Overlord and Jenning is returned to normal. But the Dark Overlord is not done and now he reveals his true foe. Oh my god, what is this? So remember when I said earlier that Howard looks pretty good for 1986? Well, this doesn't look good for any decade. This looks like the final boss from a Sega CD FMV game. Just when I think the design of their villain couldn't get any worse, Howard the Duck still finds a way to surprise me. Anyway, they manage to defeat it by blasting it with a big-ass gun that the science lab conveniently had on hand, but they still have to destroy the big space transmission doohickey before it brings the Overlord's friends to Earth. No, Howard, don't! Huh? We'll never get home. Oh, Jesus, Beverly, let me spell this out for you. Destroying it means Howard is stuck on Earth. Not destroying it means all human life is eradicated. This is not the tough decision you think it is.
So they blow it the fuck up and the world is saved, and Howard becomes the manager of Beverly's band, in case that wasn't telegraphed enough for you. And they all live disturbingly ever after. And thank God they never made a sequel, because the less I know about Howard and Beverly's relationship, the better. And that's the travesty that is Howard the Duck. I haven't read much of the comics, so I can't really say if it was a faithful adaptation or not, though I have a hard time imagining the comic developing any kind of a fanbase if it's anything like this. The acting is mostly terrible, the dialogue is all terrible, the jokes do not land, the special effects are hideous, the score does not fit the tone at all, and overall, like I said at the beginning, it's stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. The movie was nominated for seven Razzies and took home four. Worst picture, worst screenplay, worst visual effects, and worst new star for, quote, the six guys and gals in the duck suit. And I'm gonna take issue with that last one because Howard was the only decent performance in the movie and the actors and puppeteers who brought him to life absolutely did not deserve that. I won't argue with screenplay or visual effects though, those were awful. The movie may have been trash, but believe it or not, something good did come out of it. Howard the Duck indirectly led to the creation of Pixar. No, really. At the time, Lucas had just spent about $50 million building Skywalker Ranch, and he was hoping he could make that money back with the profits from Howard the Duck. Of course, the problem with that is, profits? What profits? So he was in a bit of a financial jam, and he needed to sell off some assets to avoid bankruptcy. One of those assets just happened to be Lucasfilm's newly created computer animation division, and a friend of his was willing to buy it from him above market value. That friend? was Steve Jobs. Yes, that Steve Jobs. And that computer animation studio eventually became Pixar. So without Howard the Duck, we wouldn't have had Toy Story. I can't help but think there had to have been a better way, but you know what, I'll take it. But whether it gave us Pixar or not, Howard the Duck is awful. I can't recommend watching it at all. Instead, watch a Pixar movie, any Pixar movie. Even if it's Cars, it'll still be better than this. And this is the part where I would normally talk about moving on to next year's worst picture. But we can't do that. We're going to have to stay in 1986 for a little bit longer because, as I mentioned in the last episode, Howard the Duck was not the only winner that year. They had a tie. 